Today is Friday, September 6th, and we are bringing you Block Digest 189 at block height 593,564. So, what is going on today, Rick? Oh, nothing, man. Just, yeah, enjoying another day here in Colorado. I know, you know, you guys have recently been enjoying it too, and so I know that maybe everybody's wondering where have we been. Like you were saying, everybody's been traveling, getting a little sick, but I think we all managed. Yeah, Colorado, it's a nice place to visit, don't you think? Janine, how are you? I'm good. I currently have a cat problem because the stray cats here are very enthusiastic about rubbing on my legs. Well, I'll tell you, pets in Colorado are well taken care of. They, they want you to take them home. How about you, Nopara? How are you doing today? So, regarding pets in Colorado, yeah, haven't seen how well Carmen is treating his cat. So, yeah, they are well taken care of. So yeah, I'm pretty good. The news just hit today that I'm um, stepping down as the CTO. Uh, well, CoinDesk forgot to say that I'm also stepping down as the code maintainer, which is also important. But uh, but anyhow, you guys in the digest know already. It. Uh, so 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 that's it. I'm still in Wasabi. I'm still doing everything. I just uh, I'm just doing less people and more coding and research congratulations on that man like what this is just a little over a year after wasabi launched and like uh you know you're able to actually get back into the research you really enjoy and you got a lot of competent developers over there and a real flourishing company it's really incredible to see what all you've done over there big congratulations to everybody at wasabi and zk snacks and for sure yourself i know you're going to be you know enjoying your time again you guys suck. You don't have Lightning Network integrated yet. Like, what the hell? Fuck you guys. Bitcoin Core integration is more important at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I cannot argue with that. You should also consider it an accomplishment that Coindesk, you know, asked you questions and they actually got published because I have so far have a hundred percent failure rate with that. <laughs> yeah, congratulations on that nice spread, man. It was a good picture too. At least you were cited correctly. I've had Coindesk writers call me a core developer before. Like, what the fuck are you smoking? Well, you certainly as toxic as a core developer is. <laughs> <laughs> that's harsh. That, that's, that's just harsh, bro. All that right. So, a compliment. As yeah, toxic as the Berlin the Canals? Ew. Not quite that toxic? I hope not. Probably. Probably that toxic. All right, man. So we've been gone for a long time. There's a lot to talk about. What's the first story, bud? Well, uh, this this is actually interesting. I've been waiting to talk about this for uh, more than uh, a week now. Uh, I actually found out about this directly from Bitcoin Mom in person. But uh, the judge in Florida has issued a ruling on the Ira Kleiman, uh, Craig Wright snafu down there. And so I really like first I, I'm going to I'm going to go through the, the rejoicing and all the fun stuff. But then I, I want to get into just a little kind of clarification of the the 
the nature of what's going on here. So um, first off, the judge has ruled that uh, Craig Wright willfully created fraudulent documents and acted in bad faith. And have pretty much ruled that all of the, the property under the supposed partnership between uh, Kleiman and uh, Wright is, is legitimate. Like Ira has a legitimate claim to half of that as the estate of David Kleiman and Craig Wright is going to have to pay. But, you know, that said, <laughs> she has gone through and pretty much uh, just tore apart almost all of Craig's testimony throughout the entire trial. Uh, one quote is that uh, Dr. Wright's story not only was not supported by other evidence in the record, it defies common sense and real life experience. Um, she's also said that there is strong, unrebutted circumstantial inference that Dr. Wright willfully created fraudulent documents. And Dr. Wright's testimony that the trust, the Tulip Trust, uh, exists was intentionally false. She, so, so pretty much like she, she is uh, like saying the claim by Ira to these supposed Bitcoin and the intellectual property of the Florida company is legitimate and Craig has to pay. But at the same time is explicitly saying that circumstantially, pretty much all of Wright's testimony is tantamount to fraud. And now the big question people are probably thinking to themselves is why is Craig Wright not in jail? And the very important aspect about this is that this is a civil case. This is not a criminal case. And there is a huge difference in how those two different types of trials are held in the U.S. In a criminal matter, evidence is required beyond any reasonable doubt that the conclusion reached in court is is true that it does not conflict with any evidence like there there is no doubt that a reasonable mind can hold in the conclusion that the court has reached whereas in a civil court or civil case it's based pretty much on the preponderance of the evidence there is no extreme threshold that has to be met where there is no doubt that could have merit to it. It's just what seems most likely looking at the evidence that has been entered into the court. And so pretty much what, what's happened here with, with Craig's charade and nonsense in the courtroom is he has clearly met um, the, the, the threshold for civil perjury, but nothing that actually occurred in this courtroom meets the threshold of any kind of criminal perjury charges. And so that is why like nothing has escalated to the point of him actually being charged and thrown in jail um, for, for criminal perjury, because you have a much higher threshold of proof and actually have to prove to that degree the, the intent to do that. And, you know, despite, how just batshit insane the situation is like there there is nothing that occurred in this courtroom um you know that has actually met that threshold and so for now you know that this ruling has been issued like craig has to you know pay compensation and, and lawyers fees and such to ira Kleiman, but nothing has happened in terms of criminal penalties yet but that is not completely impossible as obviously we all know these bitcoins that that Craig owes half of to Ira Kleiman don't exist. He has no control over them. So, you know, th this is kind of why things didn't go as far as people were thinking, like just throw Craig in jail. But that's absolutely not to say that that kind of outcome is completely off the table in the long term. But, you know, overall, I think this is still a, a huge victory because this, this is showing any kind of reasonable person what's going on right now, you know, just seeing how this case played out. And really at the end of the day, the, the lunatic crazy cult that's just going to keep going, no, 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 this proves that he's Satoshi are, are going to do that no matter what. So I will take the huge win that, that is pretty evident for any rational person looking at it.
Oh, yeah. What a comical situation, man. Craig is, like, labeled a fraud by the court. Thank goodness, like, somebody did it on an official capacity outside of just people yelling at him at conventions. And, yeah, it just makes me, you know, I mean, like, we've seen the disappearance of Kevin Pham with all this stuff. And, you know, we see courts actually saying he's a fraud. It just... You know, I mean, I'm thinking immediately about just what is the viability of these projects still sitting around like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. And, you know, I'm thinking about this recent OK coin donation towards Bitcoin development. And it just seems like that was just like a, uh, I don't know, just trying to get their name out there still trying to see whether or not there's any sort of viability for these projects. But it is really hard to see any reason that somebody might think that. Bitcoin SV is something that's worthy of their investment. But I guess that's where it's like the dumb money has to learn some way. And if you're investing in somebody that's a known fraud and, you know, has basically no network, no development and doesn't really understand the value proposition of Bitcoin, I think you're supposed to lose your money. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's, you know, I mean, this really it's it's. Like it, it just sucks. It, it, it's kind of the the same type of dynamic as far as like a government trying to actually get off its ass and do something. It takes a lot of time and, and momentum building before it actually happens. And I mean, it's, it's just the same kind of situation when it comes to dealing with like this kind of fraud, like somebody who will just be this bold and blatant in lying and fabricating things. And it's, it, it is what it is. Well, it's just a good thing that at least on Bitcoin Twitter and crypto Twitter, it seems like everybody's noticing this. Let's see how long it takes the market to catch up. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. Uh, Janine, Nokar, you guys got any, uh, any change to toss in the ring on this one? I would just really love to see him get some you know heat for the fact that he's been pretending to be a lawyer all this time and he clearly isn't well i mean like this is where he's got to be in some heat right about the lost coins that's where it's like the payment of that i mean that's where it's i mean at a certain point how do you deal with that i mean like i guess you have to go i mean you committed perjury you said that you have all this money and now you're owed a payment you can't afford it what happens? You go to jail. Oh, wait, wait, wait. He forged documents in court and he got away with it. He might really have some, some, some lawyer education. Well, no, the, <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. just, again, this is like the, the difference between civil and criminal court, no part. You know what I mean? Like there's a shit ton of evidence that, you know, the, these documents are forged they're fraudulent but in, in the scope of the courtroom like there's no actual evidence to prove craig himself produced that like it, it's you know this is it, it's just how like court works like you really have to like have all your bases covered otherwise you know the, there are just arguments and holes that can be poked into it because you know like i said you know when it comes to a criminal matter you have that huge threshold of no reasonable doubt and in a civil case, you have the preponderance of the evidence. So like, you know, in both ways or types of cases, you can introduce doubt very tactically and just derail something that a normal person is going to look at and go, that's a solid argument. I mean, it's, it's just how these things work. Sure. Thank you for explaining that you can make it not funny. Now I have a question. It's what I do. So what happens? <laughs> So what, what happens if he doesn't pay? What's then? Well, that eventually would get to the, the point of not complying with a court order. And that, that if, if he just doesn't pay, eventually is going to escalate to, to a criminal matter. And if you I mean, can't he, pay... He's not going to. You have to do the time. That's the payment. Mm, that, that's my point, though, is like, you know, this, 
this isn't over. Like the, eventually him not paying is going to become a whole new situation and there will be some type of legal action against him for not paying because he's been ordered to by the court. Like that that's a legal order now. He's going to fly to Pattaya. Don't worry, next time we go, we, we can meet him. <laughs> All right, well, I guess that's kicking Craig Wright to death right now. So what else is going on with no some uh, our crazy Coinbase friends? So it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to say much because I read it on RBTC, so I want to keep it keep it on the basics. But it's a it's a Shinobi rant topic on what's going on in Coinbase right now. Um, there was a culture clash between Bolaji, uh, you know, the new CTO from 21.com that has that's selling. I don't know, Bitcoin computers, whatever that means, uh, didn't make sense, even at the back then. So Balaji at the cyberpunk vision for Coinbase, what's the cyberpunk vision? To have as many cryptocurrencies as possible on Coinbase and make a lot of money with that. Now the cyberpunk vision has been, <clears throat> has been, there is another side to it from another guy who I'm not going to say his name because it's very complicated and doesn't matter because you're going to forget him. Because his vision was to, to, to make Coinbase a Bitcoin bank, the most regulated Bitcoin entity in the world. Have as many bank partnerships and as many partnerships with the traditional financial system as possible and with the regulators. So, these two <laughs> camps were crashing with each other and shouting each other in Coinbase offices. <laughs> and it just, man, it's, it's so interesting to see that, that two visions, both of them are bullshit. And, and, and that's what they are fighting for, Coinbase's feature. Uh, so what do you guys think? Do you think the multi-currency Coinbase should be the future or the, the big bank Coinbase should be the future? I think Coinbase should just die and that should be the future. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe, uh, maybe, I don't know. I think Coinbase should just keep doing what they're doing until they become irrelevant because they just really don't i mean like what maybe this is the thing that got brian armstrong to tweet about bitcoin for the first time in a couple of years so yeah i don't know i mean what the hell's going on over there other than yeah they're gonna keep doing what they're doing yeah this is stupid i don't know <laughs> it's as stupid as the craig wright case let's move on to the next topic cover that no, I mean, I really want to take a second to just like, you know, the, this, the, the idea that just having multiple shit coins on the exchange is some kind of cypherpunk vision is delusional. Like the, the idea that Bellagi is some kind of cypherpunk trying to come in and shake up Coinbase, like you're out of your fucking mind. He is just another Silicon Valley idiot. He is another one of those people delusionally thinking, like, tokenize everything. I mean, like, the fucking 21 butt box, for fuck's sake. Like, a whole Silicon Valley company, like, started with the idea of selling this mining product that, to anybody with half a brain, would be obviously instantly unprofitable. It will never be profitable because of the efficiency gains of scale and mining. Like, no, cypherpunk Coinbase is like a fucking Coinbase with a Chalmian eCash server built into it to spend your money. A cypherpunk Coinbase is a Coinbase that tries to find every single way they can to legally let you buy Bitcoin while taking as little of your private information as possible. 
That's a fucking cypherpunk Coinbase. And not a single person in that fucking company has even thought of trying to build a company like that because they're a bunch of Silicon Valley morons. They don't understand what cypherpunk is. You know, 21 was the most well-funded Bitcoin company at the time in 2014 or 15. And everyone was rooting for them. Even me, <laughs> even I was saying on every social media, I have no idea what this thing is, but if it has so much money up, money behind it, it, it must be something. That must be something behind it. And no, Balaji just scammed everyone. It was so well. Who who didn't get scammed? Who didn't believe <laughs> in? Balaji and 21 was actually your friend Chris DeRose and John Set. They were the ones who were really <laughs> spreading, looking through the bullshit right away. They, yeah. They were the only ones at the time that actually like called that company out on its shit. Like is Cypherpunk Coinbase, like that that's that's never gonna happen. Like that's not what Balaji was trying to do. And like frankly, whoever like wrote this take on that it is an idiot if they think that's what was going on well like everybody was excited about those 21 computers and they did ship something right yeah yes 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 they ship useless it just <laughs> yes <laughs> all right though all right though um, good old times uh, is there uh, anything you wanna you wanna rip on this, Janine, or you wanna just take us into the next one? He, he. There's drama to talk about. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So you might, if you had watched, uh, let's see, which episode was it? If you had watched episode 186, then you will remember that I read a personal letter written by Zuko Wilcox that advocated for the reinitiation of the Founders Reward, which has apparently now been renamed to the Dev Fund, uh, after it was scheduled to stop in October 2020. And as far as we know, it's still going to stop in October 2020 unless they change something. And you can find my analysis of that letter um, timestamped in the video description. Uh, there was also a Coinbase related story with Zcash uh, back in episode 147, if you want to see that. Um, but what happened in the last week regarding Zcash uh, has only gotten more interesting since Zuko published that letter. Um, basically, the Zcash Foundation on September 2nd released a rather blistering blog post about the ongoing nego or well what was the ongoing negotiations uh, between the foundation and the Zcash company which is now known as Electric Coin Company uh, and so in that blog post they said last week the Zcash community in the Zcash community forum the Electric Coin Company announced to both the community and the foundation that months of trademark negotiation with the foundation had fallen through we were surprised and dismayed uh, continued, um, until now, the foundation has approached the pending uh, upgrade, as in the whether to reinstate the dev fund or founder's reward, and community sentiment collection under the assumption that the electric coin company would continue working toward a two of two controlling agreement with respect to the Zcash trademark that includes Zcash, the name and the logos and things like that. Uh, which that was a very contentious part of Zuko's letter, in my view. Um, so in the blog post, they continue, we believe this to be a reasonable assumption given that many of the past public statements by the Electric Coin Company, and particularly since we reached an agreement in spirit and, and had already begun the process of re, re, uh, redlining a legal agreement. Based on the forum post above, which I'll get into later, it's a very long thread now, um, our seemingly reasonable assumption was wrong. Moreover, if the ECC continues to hold the trademark, they can arbitrarily enforce a new dev fund through the NU4, which is that upgrade. 
Therefore, any sentiment we collect and any decisions we make regarding a new dev fund are ultimately meaningless. The foundation was not established to engage in decentralization theater, and we will not uh, lend our credibility to legitimize a hollow process, end quote. Yeah, so decentralization theater, that's, um, that's harsh, but true, as far as I can see. And uh, so at the top of the blog post, they linked to a thread on the Zcash community forum where Zuko had announced on October 30th that we, the ECC, believe that uh, we should wait for the governance process to work itself out and we advocate for further decentralization of control over the trademark. As long as we remain the sole stewards of the trademark, we will use it to protect the community's decision in this governance process. And so this message did not sit well with most people in Zcash, both from the company and the foundation. Um, Aaron Tromer, I think he's from the foundation, he said that the ECC holding on to unilateral power over the trademark reflects badly on the power dynamics of the dev fund discussion. And um, I briefly watched the beginning of the latest Magical Crypto Friends because I saw that they were talking about this at the beginning. And uh, Ricardo mentioned, um, I don't think I mentioned the episode number for this, but uh, I'll add it later. There was an episode where we talked about the fact that one of the lead uh, wallet maintainers in Zcash uh, actually threatened to fork the Zcash chain because they were doing a ton of work on maintaining wallets on various platforms uh, or operating systems. And they were, you know, struggling to, you know, wrangle the whole grant uh, distribution process that Zcash has because I guess for some reason, you know, they they don't actually know how to manage funding, which is like their reason for existence in terms of the foundation of the company. It's supposed to be the purpose of these formal entities is so that you have some kind of stability in that area. And clearly they are not focusing on that. Um, so yeah, if you don't know, basically the 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 main uh, figurehead or public figure in Monero is the one who is sponsoring the, or was, I don't know if he still is, but he was or is sponsoring the lead wallet maintainer in Zcash. And yeah, and there were several interesting things that were pointed out in the thread that I want to draw attention to. First, um, the reason this is happening is because there was basically an expectation uh, that the electric coin company would either share control of the trademark uh, for Zcash with the foundation, or uh, it was also suggested that if they can't come to a sensible sharing agreement, that they should just transfer the ownership of the trademark to the foundation because, you know, of the, the way that the foundation is set up versus the way a company is set up. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of very, very dicey comments but one of the shocking things, at least to me, I don't remember who said it. I'm going to look for it now. But there was one person in this thread from, I think it was the foundation, who I think it was actually Josh who said it, Josh Cincinnati. And Josh pointed out that at least on the foundation side, they've spent over $300,000 in I I assume I assume in like you know lawyer fees and things like that they spent over three hundred thousand dollars negotiating this one issue and that's just that's just the foundation like I don't know about the company but like that's how much the foundation has spent um, I'm going I'm pretty sure it was the, I'm gonna check really quick but you guys can discuss while I'm checking that. Yeah, let's just say this is crazy how much it's like this decentralized theater is true. I mean, like they own their own forum where they discuss all this stuff and they've got wallet developers that are working hard and you got what Zuku. I'm just looking through his Twitter. He's been tweeting like a madman over the past 24 hours. I don't even know if he slept. This guy is crazy. And the company and the foundation follow along with that. You know, there really needs to be like a, a Silicon Valley style TV show about the Zcash scam. <laughs> I would watch that show. That show would be a fucking hilarious show. Peter Todd yeah. would be a consultant on it. Oh, uh, that I don't. 
that I mean that would definitely make it more of a comedy but so I just checked so Josh I don't think it was actually Josh Cincinnati or might be it was someone responding I think to Josh C um, but if you go to the thread you'll find it um, but this person who is also named Josh says uh, the electric coin company so not the foundation but the electric coin company has spent in excess of three hundred thousand dollars in direct cost to establish and protect the marks um, I have spent considerable time both on these activities and developing a donation agreement that, to my knowledge, has not been previously envisioned anywhere else. The foundation didn't do that. That was all conceived and funded by us. So, like, I don't know, they're debating about, like, bleh. Like, so the lawyer, whatever they've been spending on, like, negotiating this point, I don't know how much lawyer involvement that required, but, like, they've spent 300000 just on direct costs to establish and protect the trademark. That seems excessive to me, and I also think it's, like, I don't know, like, no one cares in Bitcoin, like, if someone were to, like, fraudulently claim that, you know, they were the owner of Bitcoin as a trademark, like, no one would give a shit. Like, no one would have that, that that's not, like, they can't really enforce that. No one would really listen to them. So apparently the trademark is, like, I, I think just the existence of anyone controlling a trademark and that being seen as some lever of power is already bad in itself and so when you have that lever and then everyone's like trying to negotiate about who's allowed to pull the lever and how, who's allowed to pull it how much and all of this it's just like really it's really awful oh my goodness yeah i mean this is where it's like i'm just thinking back to where the last time i talked to zuku it was all about trying to avoid asic and asic development because they were trying to you know, do the ASIC proof stuff and it just didn't work out and like come to find out it just like really was Zoku getting along with Jahan and trying to, you know, just control the network and control its development and, you know, yeah, control its brand and its label and, you know, it's all under this guy's name, Zoku Wilcox, but it wants to be under a foundation and a company too. But like name one person outside of that guy that anybody takes seriously. And yeah, I mean, like, as far as a central character in a story that's been playing out over the past three years, this is really one of them that takes the cake. I mean, like, yeah, the, just spending that much money and you're talking about incorporating a dev tax now after you just spent how much money getting this network bootstrapped to a point of where it is absolutely a shit show. I mean, like, yeah, Zoku, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. This dude's a little crazy. Yeah, and I just, I want to quickly read, there was another response that I thought was interesting. It was from Sonia, who's at the foundation, and she made the point that no Zcash, like I was just saying, no Zcash trademark is better than a Zcash trademark that's unilaterally controlled by one entity. And then she quote tweeted Zuko, where he said, as long as we remain the, st the sole stewards of the trademark, we will use it to protect the community's decision in this governance process. And she replies to that and says, with respect, Zuko, such a promise would carry more weight if you had ask the community about this decision the one you just announced rather than simply making a declaration which i absolutely agree with <laughs> uh, like the, the one thing i think is just most absurd about this whole situation is, is just like the rationalization for another dub fund like they're they're doing something like well what is the electric coin company doing like zk snarks that that zcash uses are completely trust-based they require a trusted setup like ZK Starks, the the the, the trustless uh, setup ones, or for zero knowledge proofs, so those are being like the most I see, like kind of looking at this stuff every once in a while being done on that is by this company Starkware, and like you know I've I've been following that because I'm a little worried this company might start getting patent happy with stuff. But like, where where is the development on the trustless setups that the electric coin company is doing? Because the the only thing I see that seems to be having any kind of progress is a totally different company. So like, what are you doing with this Zcash reward that you need to keep going? It doesn't seem to be trying to make your your technology or your platform trustless. Mm -mm -mm. 
I don't know what to say about this project. I don't know what else to say. I mean, it is stupid. I mean, like, it seems like that is a growing narrative, not just in Zcash, but Ethereum. And we know that there's a connection there with JP Morgan and their whole blockchain project that they're doing. And I'm nearly certain that Zoku has, like, come out and put Vitalik on their board or Vitalik put Zoku on their board or something to where there's that connection. And, you know, yeah, just the heavy connection with Coinbase and all their shit coinery. I, you know, I don't know what else to say about it other than it's a ridiculous project. They're really just a bunch of scammers and they're taking a bunch of people's money and trying to claim that they can provide privacy when they really can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah, like, like I said, when when's the TV show coming out? Yeah, when Silicon Zcash. No par, you're awfully quiet, Mr. Privacy Developer. I, I don't really have much input for that. Getting enough shit from the Monero fanboys? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, man. Well, I guess you want to take us into some uh some breaking news what what's going on here man well um so this is a a pretty uh hilarious story um uh yusuf he runs um coin mall I, I'm, I'm sorry if i'm getting that name wrong yusuf but it's like a small um digital goods trading platform um running on bitcoin but you know, he occasionally pokes around on websites um, looking for security vulnerabilities, and he lets the, the operator of the site know if he finds anything. And uh, a little while ago, he started poking around um, on the Blocks site, um, you know, uh, at the start of this month, and found a massive security issue. Um, there is a piece of software called Jenkins, which pretty much uh, is just a control dashboard for servers. And the Blocks uh, Jenkins board was exposed publicly. And so um, he, he contacted them. And I believe what they, they offered in terms of a bug bounty was like $250 and kept insisting that it was a very minor security issue and wouldn't actually fix it um, until uh, they found out that he was actually going to, to publish all of this publicly. Um, but, you know, this, this is a control board for all of their, their stuff running on the server. And some of the things that could have been done with this um, are, well, for instance, um, API keys to GitHub and Terminus. And for, you know, to start here, what they were using GitHub for was sharing very sensitive customer, or storing very sensitive customer information on a GitHub repository that was just pulled from GitHub with an API key accessible through this terminal. So there, there's another thing. Um, Terminus is also a, um, a hosting platform like management tool. And the API key to the command line for that was exposed. So um, <laughs> uh, let's let's see um, what could they have done with that. Pretty much anything. They could have authenticated just with the API key on the device. They could have retrieved connection information for everything connecting and loading content from the server. They could have accessed all of their subscriber or subscribers' information, and they could have literally just replaced the entire website with something malicious loaded with malware and everything was set up so that there were not even alerts or notifications for changes like this so some somebody could have completely loaded the blocks website with malware and th they would not have even known until it was too late because a major change like that in their system would not have sent a fucking update to their staff and so this is the blocks platform this is the, the mr upstart news media company always hitting the hard truths this is this is how they're set up like complete fucking morons they're storing private information 
in a GitHub repository. The control board for their entire platform was exposed, leaving their entire customer base's private information up to theft and access. And the degree of control available to an attacker was so extreme that they literally could have turned the entire block website into a giant malware platform to try to steal all of the cryptocurrency they can from all of their users. This is the, the degree of competence of the block. So let's give a round of applause to them with this giant egg on their face and watch how Mike Dudas doubles down like a man child and tries to claim that he's being extorted or this wasn't really a big issue. Um, this is the kind of risk you're exposing yourself to paying for the air quote premium news of the block. So Yes. You know, recently I read a, I read a research, or rather just an abstract of it, that how many this this researcher tried to find uh, secrets in GitHub repositories, and he found a lot. I'm not gonna say the number because I don't remember it, but it was a very large one. <laughs> so it, it just very sensitive information, passwords and stuff, just lying on GitHub. GitHub histories, right? It's, it's so crazy. <laughs> so wait, you're telling me that the media outlet who doesn't even understand basic statistics is also bad at protecting their own website? Yep. Which should be very simple. I mean, all you're really doing is rendering text, and you're also using Coinbase for the you know e-commerce part of it. So like... This shouldn't be hard, but apparently it is. I wonder if they consider it locked up because, yeah, it's like you got to whitelist Coinbase addresses or something. Like, yeah, yeah, this saying's really stupid. If you're a company working in Bitcoin at all, you should be knowing that you're dealing with more competent technical people who are going to be probing you for vulnerabilities and figuring out who's working with you. No, but I mean, like, really, like, think about this right now. Like, Block is, is trying to, like, set themselves up like the, the Bloomberg of the crypto space. Imagine if Bloomberg fucked up so fucking bad that being subscribed to their news service and price feed shit could literally have all of your investments stolen. Like, that that's what just happened right now. Yeah, I mean, it's a stupid move. I mean, jeez. I don't know what to say other than, yeah, like you got your customer's information there. If your customers are paying attention to Bitcoin and crypto. And this is just where it's like there's a, I don't know, about the shit coinery guys and the Bitcoin and like things like Coinbase. It's like I don't think they really take into consideration or they don't care about the idea that when this thing does take off to where there's like a large value attributed to Bitcoin and people will start going and digging through these customer records and figuring out where they could find people with large amounts of Bitcoin. It's it's just stupid. If you think about if you're like if you're looking at Bitcoin on its roadmap and its long term value proposition and you're going to report on the space. I mean, like, yeah, you should be thinking about, you know, our customers are people that it's important to keep their privacy intact where we can. Yeah, and like but the I guess that's not the case. part is like, how do we know that they haven't been compromised? That like Yusuf was the first person to find this. How how do we know we that don't. all of these records aren't already floating around out there? Like I said, the whole system was set up so that you could literally replace the entire website with malware, and the block staff would not even be alerted about it. How the fuck do we know that this wasn't compromised and this information isn't out there? No, there's no way to know that. So it's it's like yeah, you know what I mean. Like this, I, I've I've had issues with the block for a lot of things, just centered around like journalistic accuracy and integrity. But like this just takes the cake, and it just goes to show that like this kind of like you know system, like pay, even just being a news site that charges for news. When you're collecting private information like that, this is the kind of fucking thing that can happen. Like this literally could have led to a large portion of their user base having any Bitcoin 
or crypto that they store on the device that they're using getting stolen because a news site is just raking in all of this private information in a business model and being completely incompetent at storing it. Like that is how fundamentally dangerous just this information being out there as something collective is. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised at all if block subscribers were getting targeted or something like that. Because if you're subscribed to the block, like you're a well-off person, <laughs> if you can afford to pay them that much for you know the quality of the writing they're producing, like you're a well-off person. So this would be a perfect honeypot for someone who wanted to find people who possibly. I mean, they don't have to, if you, if they're using Coinbase, I assume they can also pay with fiat or something, but I would not be surprised if they, you know, someone took an interest before this. Yeah, I don't know. It's like they see it as like, well, it's this information, that's all it is. It's like, man, they just don't understand. It's like you probe, you get that information, next thing you know, you're probing that information and those individuals for their vulnerability, it's, it's a freaking, yeah, it's just one little chink in the armor that's going to hurt their customers. And yeah, I don't know. I'm just not thinking about it. I mean, more companies need to be thinking about that. I'm sure there's, you know, like there's companies like, uh, you know, there's Real just quick, interesting. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I have to say it is so much more than a chink in the armor. It's like a breastplate that just has a giant hole where your heart is. Yeah, I mean, well, it's just one of those where, for sure, it's like somebody could be trying to set themselves up as well as they can to remain anonymous in the system. And, you know, that is just definitely one spot where, yeah, I mean, they go into the block and their IP address is logged. And next thing you know, somebody's scanning that, searching that IP address to figure out who's really behind. You never know. I mean, it's just a lot of stuff where, you know, one bad problem in the implementation can lead to a lot of big problems. And, yeah, companies in this space should definitely be thinking about that. And there are companies that are doing that. I mean, you got, you know, companies that I'm sure are doing the right thing. And I, there are some that are, for sure, like uh, CoinKite and, you know, Casa Hodel and Kraken. There's a few companies where it's like, I know they're doing right by data and trying to make sure that the data is as secure as possible and, you know, definitely just trying to make sure that they're covered but not, like, yeah, just doxing the hell out of people all the time. Mm -hmm. Again, Mr. Nopara, where, where's the privacy wizard's uh, input on the, the, the privacy oh, relevant yeah. CK Snacks. Why are you always being so quiet about that? I don't have any. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, I don't know, Rick. Next one. Yeah, let's get right into it. Let's talk something about what's been. I seen. I saw a lot of people talking about this, so figured we should cover it. Well, yeah, we all we're always on the lookout for which countries are taking progressive stances on the Bitcoin ecosystem. And Portugal has been a very progressive EU member state in general. Just not too long ago, they legalized all drugs in the country, which had an interesting effect on the amount of overdoses and abuse cases. Anyway, Portugal is now taking the lead in having the most clear and Bitcoin-friendly tax code. We have known for a little while that the tax code for Bitcoin there is favorable, but now with this recent clarification, there can be no doubt. Portugal's tax authority put out a clarification letter linked in the show notes that says, Bitcoin payments and realized gains are exempt from capital gains taxes. That means you can buy and sell Bitcoin without the worry of having to report all your cap potential gains. However, it should be emphasized here that this is for individuals only. Businesses related to Bitcoin still have to report and pay their gains. This, is, uh, this recent clarification by the tax authority was put out because of an un unknown company there put in a request for clarification on the country's value-added tax, VAT system. And Portugal's tax authority uses a precedent from a 2006 EU council directive, quote, transactions including negotiations concerning currency, 
banknotes, and coins used as legal tender, with the exception of collector's items, this is to say gold, or silver, or other metal coins, or banknotes, which are not normally used as legal tender or coins of numer numeristic interest, are, quote, exempt from that, close quote. After this news came out, operator of Swedish Bitcoin exchange Bitcoin.se requested for further clarification about running a Bitcoin exchange in the country. The court found that it's subject that it's subject to an exemption under Article 135.1e of the EU's VAT directive. Quote, the exchange of cryptocurrency for real currency constitutes a provision of consideration exempt from VAT. Close quote. So all of this puts Portugal as the front runner for those libertarians and Bitcoiners trying their damnedest to escape the long arm of tax authorities. And we should reiterate that this is just for individuals, not businesses. Then we should also remember that this code can be changed and updated in the future to where you will have to report those gains. I mean, we saw what happened after the 2017 price rise. All of a sudden, governments were very interested in Bitcoin to get paid those taxes. And who's to say how long this will last? I don't, I don't know. But for now, it's all tax-free for the individuals. In order to be considered a Portuguese tax resident, you have to have own a house in Portugal or if you stay in the country for more than 183 days. EU citizens can move to Portugal but need a registration certificate to stay longer than three months. And all other citizens must have the right Visa then start the process for permanent residence. Yeah, all right, so that's the story. Now we'll have to wait and see how uh, some of these other countries trying to remain competitive for Bitcoin respond. Countries like Belarus, Malta, Switzerland, and Singapore. Then it'll also be interesting just to see how institutions like the IRS respond to this. So did you guys catch this in Twitter? Did y'all have any thoughts on this? You've been to Portugal anytime recently thinking about going back? Um, well, I know that in regards to Switzerland, they also don't require capital gains um, taxes for individuals. They might, I, I mean, I think they do for trading, like if you're a professional trader, but if you're just, you know, a normal individual buying and selling occasionally, then I don't think there's capital gains on that. So Switzerland, I think, is already ahead of the game. Um, in Germany... I think that I don't remember the exact time period, but I think it's like if you if you trade uh, as an individual, I think it's a similar situation where you either don't pay capital gains or the capital gains are really low. And I think Germany also has a rule that if you hold for more than I think two years, a year or two years or something, then there's no capital gains after two years, and then. Anything up to that, I think you're paying like long term or short term based on, you know, smaller periods of time. So Switzerland is already ahead of the game, so doesn't surprise me that Portugal would do this. I think it's kind of interesting how they tie like the the reasoning to gold and silver and like other collectibles. Because like, you know, I I have no clue how independent the portugal tax authority is as far as like drafting tax codes or how that works but i would imagine it would be a lot more difficult to try to change this later down the line now that the, this decision has kind of been tied to a precedent with other things like how do you disentangle bitcoin from that bigger category you put it in now if you want to try to argue later that it is subject to gains. Yeah. You kind of double and remuted yourself. There. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's where I was just saying, like, uh, yeah, you know, Switzerland and Germany, those guys are definitely with this, like, competitive, trying to just uh, make sure that Bitcoin is as regulation-friendly as possible to try and get Bitcoin in the country. And, yeah, I think that, you know, there is that, you know, just that stipulation where if you're like a professional trader, like you were saying, then you might have to pay something. And I think like you were saying, there's like a little bit of a tax on Germany. And this one's just, you know, they're trying to make it clear cut across the board. You don't need it. And yeah, maybe that label, you know, placing it in the same category with other metals and collectibles like that, you know, it will be a harder time to try and reverse this and, you know, go after those gains at a later date. I mean, you know, there really are as much as there's nations like our own in the United States and 
you know, other countries that are really trying to just like heavily surveil this system and try and figure out a way to put it under their control. There are these countries that are trying their damnedest to make sure that people with Bitcoin are coming to the country because, yeah, I mean, eventually, you know, you, the more Bitcoin in the country, the more valuable that country will be. Mm -hmm. Aren't you going to ask me your regular uh, drug and criminal expert that what's my opinion on this topic? Of course, no para. What is your opinion as like the expert on the drugs and everything going everything on over there? Illegal. Yes. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. I mean, Portugal seems like a cool place. I mean, I'd like to go check it out. In fact, I think. Uh, well, I don't think I'm applying for two more of those presentations out there. Hopefully, I'll get one of them. Wait, no par. You, you are you saying you went? to a country where all the drugs are legal and you didn't do all the drugs i think you did that wrong <laughs> i go to lots of countries where all the drugs are good and i still don't do them you did that That's... wrong. Ah. they are only fun when you cannot do them yeah it's only fun if it's wrong all right, man. So that was that one. Why don't you take us into something that I thought was fake news, but maybe it's not. What's going on here? Bump. So um, Vanak and Solid X are uh, fed up with the SEC's bullshit and are going to be pulling an interesting move. Um, so obviously everybody knows... Uh, they, they have been trying to get an ETF approved for a very long time uh, from the SEC. And they just keep pulling up the same excuses, which we've frankly gone over how bullshit they are here more times than, than I can count. So we'll just assume you, you've been here for that. Uh, but they're going to be taking advantage of uh, Rule 144A which lifts restrictions on trades of private or privately placed securities so that investments can be traded pretty much just between uh, qualified institutional buyers and shorter holding periods and so pretty much um you know this is being described as um routing around them to do an etf but um, they're they're kind of calling it a BTF or a broker traded fund, and really the 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 main uh, thing here is that this is not going to be listed on any kind of exchange, and it's just going to be trading completely over the counter. But it will be settled in physical Bitcoin, unlike the uh, current futures markets. And so pretty much like they're they're just at the point where. Uh, they've decided to screw it um, instead of continuing to wait and go through this crazy process the SEC keeps mucking around in to try and get a publicly listed ETF. They're just going to do a private OTC product that works the same way pretty much and just start trying to like show that this there is demand for this, there is use for this, like people want to trade this and, and it can be done properly. And like honestly, I think this is the perfect way to do this. I mean, it's you can do it now. It's fully within the regulations. And I think even for like big legacy companies like this that are totally bound by regulations, that this is still the Bitcoin attitude. Like you, you just find a way to do it and just do it. Like stop sitting around and asking permission. And, you know, I, I really think it's perfect. And I think to some degree, it's kind of showing that even like these huge legacy players are willing to just kind of take that attitude and go with it. Like that's how much they want to get into this space and build these things and integrate into it. And I think that's a hugely positive sign for just how the entire institutional money that's always a month away, you know, it, it's, it's a very good sign. Like it's showing, that's not just talking out of our asses. It's just like, think about all of the roadblocks involved. And they're finally just deciding, let's just route around them however we can. Like, let's just stop waiting for the roadblock to get lifted. 
And that's a fucking awesome thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense for what we've been seeing as far as uh, what BACT's doing and, you know, their ability to route around because the CFTC's guidance on the way that they should set up this custody. And, I mean, like, there seems to be a clear route for these ETFs and the way that you would get those things out. And if that route's there and, you know, you can find a way in between these agencies and get that product out to the market, you know, hey, more power to you. I mean, you know, like you're saying, Venex, Venex and Solid X have been working on this for so long that, you know, yeah, I, I could just, it's hard to say. Like, I remember when we first started talking about ETFs, it was like the first one would get approved and then a bunch of them would come out. And it's like, it seems that, you know, yeah, you know, there's backed, which, I mean, I guess technically isn't an ETF, but still doing the same thing. And you know access to the same customer base so yeah i yeah i'd expect vanek to do it to just rush out with it too i mean you know and those that have been sitting around on the sidelines like i don't know if jim and i and the winklevite twins are still trying to do an etf but they were the, some of the first trying to get this stuff approved so i wouldn't be surprised yeah i just wouldn't be surprised if we start to see a lot more of these come along whenever when the first one gets approved not even approved just out there 2013, Winklevoss ETF is going to happen. Yeah, we are going to be rich, yeah. <laughs> okay, it, it didn't happen. 2014, it didn't happen. 2013, another ETF is going to happen. Now my thinking has changed. Well, is this really good? I mean, yeah, we are going to be rich, but, you know, just a lot of money is going to be centralized there and by 2019 we would have a ETF that's holding 19% of all bitcoins in existence and that would make not that wouldn't be very good scenario but the ETF didn't happen then I'm like okay 2016 ETF doesn't happen, 2017 ETF doesn't happen, 2019 ETF, is it going to happen? Well, it looks like it doesn't, but my reaction is like, uh, who cares anymore? The market is just so liquid, I don't think an ETF would be, would be taking over two large amounts of money on Bitcoin, so it just doesn't matter anymore. So, so yeah. It's a, uh, it's not as a centralized risk, I think, anymore because we just we just grew that big. Well, two things, no power. Like one, I mean, things like this are absolutely necessary. Like, it, it, think about the economic consequences of Bitcoin at a large scale. Like that is a huge landslide wealth redistribution, and there are a lot of people in this world. There's just not realistically any way for them to expose themselves to Bitcoin to protect themselves from that landslide, except things like ETFs. Like that kind of stuff, it needs to happen now at this point. And two, like an ETF, like baskets can be like closed out and redeemed. So it's like a, a Bitcoin, like going into an ETF isn't necessarily like just forever sucked into an etf like you can have baskets redeemed like that those bitcoins can come out of those etfs again so like that's it's not like a permanent like oh shit like wall street's got that forever like i i'm more concerned about like things like gbtc from grayscale because that is um of kind of like that like as a as an owner of gbtc you're not allowed to actually redeem that um with grayscale for bitcoin like you can only buy and sell the the stock note you know what else is absolutely necessary buying coffee with bitcoin it's like it is it really is you can't argue with that it is very important for money to work for small transactions just like large transactions but i mean you can't deny that there is an underlying issue the coffee is that where blockchains don't scale okay now we figured out we can put it on the lightning network but 
there is an underlying issue with an ETF too that would corner most of Bitcoin's money. So even even I don't know, ten percent would be a catastrophe. I think it's uh, it's no, it's not. You can't centralize that I mean, much money into like, one. No part. Place. Like trust me. Like there are. Just think about the Bitcoin scripting system, no para. Like you can fucking, it's it's not a problem. Like you could make an ETF that's literally just like a channel factory, except the way the time locks are set up. You can like it. It would be a very long process to close it down and pull your money out on chain. Like you you, you can build something like an ETF in a distributed way through shit like the scripting system or like a state chain. Like think about that. A state chain is another way that you could actually have like air quote ETF shares that are actual Bitcoin smart contracts. Like the, the whole programmability of Bitcoin that everybody is looking at as far as like building second layers for payments, you can build second layers for financial products too in the same way like that script works for both of those yeah sure but those who are interested in building these things are not building it this way yet it's a, because it's, they're just building are, it it's a no, centralized it's, it's honeypot because no mm. think about how early this is and how unprepared all of the legal system is to handle stuff like that. They're building centralized things now because it's it's not possible legally and regulatorily to do the kind of stuff I'm talking about yet. But it will be when people actually start realizing the security benefits and just all, all, all of the benefits that you can get by doing a, a financial product like that instead of just a completely trusted thing. Banks still run COBOL and Fortran. There is just no reason to do that. There is, you can do that with modern languages much better and faster, but no, you, you just, these, these things are hard to change. So if something is set, set up, they are not changing it until Dude, they get hacked. That's your fallacy, Nopara. It's, you, they don't have to change it. They move to something new. We lost you in the best possible time. <laughs> I mean, with that attitude, nobody's going to use Bitcoin. We have PayPal and bank wires. Like... What what kind of attitude is that in this space? Well, I think he's saying it's not too much of a problem because of how big we've grown. I mean, but I get it. It's like there's different products and there's different custody solutions that are coming out. As you know, I mean, eventually these things will just keep evolving. So on that note, let's just do a quick note here. Yeah, on the hills of this Van X story, the backed warehouse custody went live today. So they're now accepting customers' Bitcoin deposits and withdrawals, and there's only 17 days left until those backed daily and monthly futures contracts launch, which that's September 23rd. I know most of y'all know about these contracts and that they're coming, but the custody just went live today. So, uh, yeah, major institutions are figuring out a way to do this. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know, like I said, I, I'm not really sure what to think, whether this is going to be just a, a big nothing burger or a huge market event, but we'll see. Like, that, that institutional shit, it's coming. It's here. Like, they, they, they're just going to find a way to get it live at this point. Yeah, well, they're doing it with Bact. And we'll see what's going on with Vanek and SolidX in the future. And I'm sure we're going to see more of these products coming along. All right. So we have an update here on the uh, mining situation over in Iran. Last we reported on this topic was episode number 184, Orange Coin Bad. 
At that time, we were discussing the government's plan to implement legal regulations for the mining industry. We talked about how this could bring the mining industry over there into a more transparent and well-oiled machine. However, it appears to have, have had the reverse effect. The idea was to eliminate any initial operation from using the very cheap electricity cost in the country of less than one cent per kilowatt hour. Those would be reserved for companies within compliance and are legally licensed to operate in the country. Well, the mining industry doesn't really care much for compliance and has opted to move elsewhere. This is according to the recent Bitcoin Magazine article on the on the subject linked in the show notes. And uh, yeah, kudos to Bitcoin Magazine for getting a reporter out there on the ground. And uh, so, in the article, he interviews miners who have uh, they interview miners who have left the country and discuss the problems facing the industry in Iran. It's not just a heavy price now associated with running an unlicensed operation, which is equal to the average real price at which Iran exports its electricity to other nations, or 70% of the average real price at which the country ships off its natural gases. That electricity cost is heavy, but so are the operational hazards from operating within the country. Hazards like miners being seized, power surges, replacing new equipment, getting it in the country, the fluctuation of the U.S. dollar, and the high cost to employ workers in the remote locations. All of this on top of the added costs for the electricity has become too much. The head of the nonprofit Iran, Iran blockchain community, they told Bitcoin Magazine, quote, we, will welcome the fact, we welcome the fact that the government took a step to regulate and recognize crypto mining as an industry, but the energy prices are in no way economical or competitive and will only lead to capital flight, close quote. The IBC is currently lobbying the parliament and other entities to reform these new regulations, and if it fails, they plan to file a formal complaint with the Administrative Court of Justice. There are still a lot of uh, bright people in Iran trying to make the best future possible for their country with this technology, so I hope they're able to overturn some of these regulations because Iran is one of those countries that really needs Bitcoin. They're still under heavy U.S. sanctions, and it's very hard to move value in and out of the country. And, uh, yeah, that's just an update on the situation over there and where, the way things stand. You guys uh, have any comment on the way things are playing out over there? Well, I mean, it's, it, it sucks that it's not working out for miners there. But, you know, ultimately, uh, if a bunch of miners leave, things will eventually reach an equilibrium where some who stay will be profitable. And that's just how this market works. I mean, it's like it, it, it's. It sucks, but like I said, when you know we first started looking at this situation, like it, the amount of power in some areas they were drawing was crazy. Like you were seeing like double digit like percentage growth in power consumption for whole like regions, and that's that's crazy. Like that's the type of thing if you don't start adjusting prices for that, like you are going to just start having huge oil reserves just burned off because miners will keep coming there until those prices adjust. And like that's something that has a serious like long-term consequence on the the people in that area. Like if if miners just came and sucked up all their resources and then left because like they just kept prices cheap the whole time, like that would fuck everybody in that country. Yeah, I mean this is kind of just part of the mining process and coming to try and build a favorable regulatory environment to where people are okay to mine there. I mean, there's a lot of this back and forth and you know, miners move their machines where there's cheap electricity and yeah, they don't really, uh, you know, stick around for too long. As soon as that window is not there, they, there's lots of other places to go. And then, yeah, it kind of forms an equilibrium. And then you start to have that competitive regulation. So, yeah, I'll just go right into this other one because it just is so rel relative to what we're talking about. So miners are leaving Iran, but where are they headed? It appears the answer is an old abandoned Soviet era factories in Siberia. Miners are headed into the cold temperatures to cut costs, but they are also getting plenty of abundant, inexpensive electricity. There's a town called Bratsk with, hydro, with a hydroelectric station in eastern Siberia that is powering large percentage of these new mining operations, and the average cost out there is about four cents per kilowatt hour, which as opposed to the rest of Russia, that's around seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour. 
And these are largely just those trailer units filled with ASICs under heavy guard and surveillance just sort of parked there next to the hydroelectric station. And Dmitry Osirsky, CEO of Electric Electro Farm, says, quote, the surplus of electric power in Russia is huge due to the closure of some of the Soviet plants and to the fact that energy consumption in general became much more efficient over time, close quote. And he estimates across Russia there is a joint capacity of 600 megawatts mining Bitcoin. That's around that 10% of the total 7 gigawatts powering the network. And the other thing attracting all these miners is not just the cheap electricity, but it's exactly what, <coughs> what they're trying to avoid in Iran. There's no legal status for cryptocurrency in Russia, and it is not subject to taxation or securities regulation or all of this uh, headache that they're going through over there. While setting up data centers to mine is considered a business that has to stay within compliance, the local governments are working with miners and electric companies to keep the industry around. The Brass City government pledged to invest $7.5 million into building local data centers and is taking interns from the city's Brass State University. The city's mayor said, quote, It's an absolutely new part of the economy and commerce in Bratsk, and for us, this project is interesting in every regard. It's providing new jobs and new big taxes paid to the city budget, close quote. So, yeah, there are these uh, heavy mining regulations going on in different countries, and then we start to see the competitive you know, nature of electricity costs and governments trying to bring new economic activity to the area actually start to play to where, yeah, maybe Iran will respond and say, okay, well, we're going to make our electricity 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour and we're also going to work with electricity companies and then yeah there is an equilibrium found but it is a back and forth game with these miners yeah that is you know russia would be insane not to start trying to attract mining because of how oil rich they are and just the the trouble with sanctions and just the general global situation with like selling that like if they can just turn that into bitcoin like you're you're taking your resource and doing something productive with it. But I, I need to just stop and go off on a tangent for a second though, because you just uh -oh. blew my mind with like the, the, the breakdown and why there's surplus electricity uh, from, from the, the head of that company. Like the, the, the fact that like the Soviet union just planned out their energy capacity based on what they needed and all of the shit they're building they just planned and then built it. Like there was no market forces to like make something efficient. So when the Soviet Union failed and those market forces for all those products kicked in and they started getting more and more efficient, like you just had that surplus power from the, the communist days that, that was planned out in a very stupid and efficient way. That's just like mind boggling. Like, I, I like I never like really thought about like something that subtle and nuanced in, in the whole crossover phase from the Soviet Union to Russia today. <laughs> yeah, that roadmap. I mean, I guess it played out in their favor. A bit. I mean, like that's <laughs> kind of ironic. <laughs> No, par, Janine, you guys got any comment about mining and what's going on in Iran and Russia or Siberia? Well, Cold. if... Uh, <laughs> Cold. Yeah, I mean, I prefer... Janine wanted to say that she prefers cold. Oh, yeah, that's right. I know. It was really hot here, and I felt bad. So we tried to stay cool. Can you guys not hear me? You oh, we can now. For just a second. Okay, so what I was saying is that if anyone's noticed, my Twitter profile has a as roaming Siberia. So, hi. Hey, yeah, you need to take some pictures of these mines. Send it over. Well, I guess you might get in trouble. They're like walking around with armed guards and everything. All right, man. So. No part. You want to take us into what's going on with mixed bitcoins? Yes, just a quick note that uh, because I talked about it in the last uh, last or maybe before the last episode, 
of blog digest uh, what was in the channel is this webinar is that well the bitcoins those are going into bitcoin mixers are less than 10 percent are considered to be illicit and this is the centralized mixers uh, because that's where they have data from they are the largest uh, so, so so not as much as people would think and now uh, there were actually news articles about this surprising fact that oh wait people normal people really want to protect their privacy how, how can it be possible <laughs> so so yeah so surprise there is a market demand for privacy from normal people And I don't have the news desk uh, in front of me, but I think I'm not the next one, right? No, you are. You are the next one. But it, it's shocking to is think it chain though, is it... that, that a husband wouldn't want his wife to know when he's buying porn. I mean, just shocking. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Japanese anime porn. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, no, that's no, what man, every that's husband terrible. wants to watch with with his wife. So yeah. Anyway, uh, the yeah. Tell us about what's going on with the chain analysis. The, the other small quick note is that uh, when I was registering the chain analysis next webinar, I wanted to 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 point out that I'm from Taiwan because, you know, you always put some fake names and then I, it, 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 it get into, I, I just noticed that they have the Dropbox as a Taiwan, a province of China. This is what's written there, which is just, Ooh, which is just that's sad, bad. Like, really sad. Oh, wow, man, they took that stance. Ooh. I mean, it can be just, just uh, well, the developer was Chinese or the developer was using a service that was written by China, or they really actually support the communist government. I, I, I don't know. It's, it, but it's, it's sad. It's, it's not cool. Yeah, that's pretty harsh. Man. So for, for, I'm for, curious. For those of you who don't know, yes. No, go ahead. I'm just thinking about something. It's just a very quick history lesson is that for those of you who don't know, it's like when the communists took over China, it was actually the Chinese government who ran from China to, to the island of Taiwan and then the communists couldn't took it over. So basically, Taiwan is the original Chinese government, <laughs> original China, and the communist China is the, the, the new China. And then the communist China wants to get Taiwan, even though it has never been under the control of the Communist Party, right? So, but they are pressuring them in every possible way. And the reason I feel so strongly about this is because I lived in Taiwan for a very long time, and 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 this that's a great country. I mean, Chinese people doing democracy is like, and I would live there if my girlfriend would would like it. I would still live there. It's 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 the best place I I've ever been. Yeah. I saw Mike open, Janine. You were going to say something. Say it. Say it. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. I keep dropping it. But what I say is, speaking of chain analysis, based on the feedback that I got from my presentation, uh, a lot of people are very interested in your analysis of their webinars and stuff. They find it quite funny. I bet you they just want to buddy up with China because it's like, yo, China, we'll track all your citizens for you. But China's well, that's like, hey, you're not Chinese. <laughs> well, this is where I was you just know, thinking about. Part. 
Chainalysis and Peck Shield were involved in that plus token trying to track those outputs. And like, I'm trying to look real quick to see was Chainalysis taking the stance to try and keep those uh, Bitcoins within the country or were they? Yeah, I think they were actually in the Peck Shield. I don't know. And remember, there was a competing argument between the companies about the narrative as to what to do with the funds. And Peck Shield was saying, or maybe it was Chainalysis, it was saying if that large amount of money, over a billion dollars in Bitcoins were taken, then it would be impossible to track. You know, another fun thing is that the Taiwanese people uh, say that, that they are Chinese and know that they are Chinese, but when a foreigner would tell them, hey, you are Chinese or something like that, they really hate that because they because they know that you mean that, hey, you are communist Chinese, not like uh, original Chinese. So anyway, it's, it's, it's a fun fact. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to go visit that place one day just to check it out. Hong Kong, at least. Yeah, dude. So that's that. Why don't you tell us about some big uh, development going on with uh, some candy bars? Boom. I'm about to explain how wasabi is going to be obsolete. Not really, because it's totally different design goals. <laughs> but um, so um, Snicker is a idea that Adam Gibson has been working on for a while. A simple, non-interactive coin join with keys for encrypted or encryption reuse, and pretty much the. What he's done here is just written a formal specification for this. And I'm just going to go through the important parts. And if you really want to learn every little detail so you can implement it yourself, the, uh, the link to the specifications in the show notes. But the general idea here is to be able to um, coordinate a coin join between two people with no interaction. So one person puts something out there and the other person takes it and does something with it. And those are the, the only steps involved. And th this comes with a, uh, a kind of catch um, just because of how the cryptography involved works. But you need to have a public key that you can see visibly. And so what that pretty much means um, now at least, is you have to find some addresses on the blockchain that have been reused. So an address that has been spent from before, um, revealing the public key, but that still has an unspent output associated with it. And pretty much what you would do here is you would take that um, public key and you would kind of tweak it so that uh, you, you create a new one, um, kind of similar to you know how you tweak keys for some of the, the more fun things you can do with Schnorr uh, public keys. And pretty much create a pre-signed transaction where you take your input and do what you're gonna do with it. And you take this, this input from uh, some random person you don't know that you found on the blockchain and spend it to this address that you've generated that they will be able to generate a private key for tweaking the key um, or the matching private key to that public key and be able to spend that. And you encrypt it to a public key they can decrypt and drop it out there. Like, and you know, this, this could work really any way, but the, the most basic way is there's just some kind of server or message board where people post these proposals and you go look to see if there's any involving you. And the idea is that, you know, you can just do this and throw it out there and you can even have a bunch of different proposals using the same inputs. And if somebody sees one they're okay with, you know, they'll just sign it and complete it and then broadcast it. And you've just had a two person coin join without any kind of interaction. And you know, you can also do this um, a second way um, without address reuse, where um, you look for a transaction on the chain 
um, that you can kind of guess common ownership uh, between inputs and outputs. And what you do is you would tweak the, the key to create a new public key using one of the inputs um, that's spent. But the input that you're trying to get this person to spend is one of the unspent um, outputs with a different address that you only think they might have the key to in that transaction. And so you might have to do some extra um, proposals with this, you know, to make sure that you've accurately guessed that, um, you know, this unspent output is something they own. And the address that I created um, to send it to is also um, an address that they own and can create. And then the, the last um, thing is really after Taproot and Schnorr are added, um, that would expose raw public keys. So you wouldn't need to use um, these kind of tricks, you know, either guessing um, common coin ownership or picking an address that's been reused. You could just use any um, Schnorr Taproot address because it would be a public key. But one thing I, I do want to say here, though, is there you would have to be very careful on the receiving end to never accept and, and finalize and submit one of these coin joins that sends to a taproot address where somebody else could spend your coins. So that would be one thing that the, 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 the person receiving a proposal and using it would have to be very careful with after taproot. But, you know, the general idea here is that this, this is just an open um, specification now and anybody can just integrate this into a wallet. And one of the interesting things um, he points out here is most wallets out there can just concentrate on only being able to receive proposals from other people and, and submit a final transaction. And you don't have to have the wallet support actually creating and submitting proposals in order to use this. Like it would be more complicated or special wallets doing that. But it would be very easy for any wallet out there to at least implement being able to accept and use one of these proposals. And so, you know, I, I joked when we started about obsoleting Wasabi, but, you know, the, these are different types of coin joins for different uses. Like this, this kind of snicker proposal is just for like simple, quick coin joins to add or like fix a little bit of lost privacy or maybe even you know make payments using them but the, the, it's not going to replace the kind of large um, set coin joins that need central coordination to be done quickly and efficiently but you know it's you know it's it's a nice tool and i think it complements the existing types of coin join proposals out there and it's definitely something i think that should be integrated into wallets out there and put out there as an option for people to use because it, you know when it comes to privacy like it's every extra tool you can give somebody helps hey two puppy transactions are coming back baby <laughs> yeah satoshi 2.0 we brought back pay to endpoint now we're bringing back pay to puppy <laughs> anyway uh, yeah, I, I think it's awesome and I would like to explain it uh, also because I think it's important to, it, it was always, Snicker was always a thing like, like we always talked about it, but just, I, I tell Adam Gibson, hey, we should, we, sh we should work on Snickers more and he's telling me, yeah, we, we should revisit this idea more, but don't call it Snickers because it's Snicker, not Snickers. I always call it that. Anyway, so it, it's really something that was like always, always like out there for a while. Stop it's walking like away from really the mic. <laughs> I, I, I'm not away. So it was always something that was out there for a while now, but no one really explored it. And, and I'm going to spoil something from my presentation on Baltic Honey Badger next week. But this this is one of the so there are a couple of ways how Bitcoin privacy can turn can 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 happen and one way is that we could have large coin joins but the other way is that we could have 
small coin joints and though that would not practically solve individual privacy but this would be more <sighs> this could be faster this could be more economical and also uh, this needs less coordination but also this would completely throw off blockchain analysis like like Monero, right? It doesn't have large anonymity sets yet. Uh, every transaction is a mix. So uh, anyway, sneaker is like, yeah, people say, uh, I mean, sure, you could only use it for limited situations, but no, I think we can, we can figure out how to use it for not very limited situations. I mean, the pop keys is something that you, when you receive, receive some money you don't expose your pub key but you're going to expose it anyway so maybe you just you can just expose it to somewhere to someone so you can do sneaker um here's an idea no problem. anyway i think it's workable you know what you could use snicker for combining payments with lightning channel uh liquidity rebalancing Like if if you like if I do a snicker with you, that's pretty much closing out a lightning channel and trying to get you to close out a lightning channel. We can rebalance things simultaneously into other channels, and then even like potentially like I send a bunch of money to you and just give it to you, and you route like a percentage of that back to me into some other channel that I have. You know what I mean? So I'm giving you extra but money. But isn't it only if we put, only if we, we write the sneaker in Miniscript and we put it on a side chain? No? No, but like, or no problem. Like, state I mean, stop, for too? stop being a smart ass. <laughs> and, and, and like, uh, I'm serious. Like, you, I give you extra money out of my coins on chain, but you pay that back to me privately on the Lightning Network through another channel I have. Like, Snicker is like the perfect kind of like protocol to have that kind of coordination and interaction between people on lightning to add that extra bit of privacy because it's just two people involved you just throw it out there until somebody accepts it yeah i i, I can't argue with that <laughs> But uh, by the way, I realized what's wrong with my microphone. When I get excited, I start walking fast around, and that loses the. <laughs> that's that's when my voice goes 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 wrong. So stop so, it! Yeah, you you are stop missing it. out of my finest moments. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I would like to explain sneaker to uh, just quickly if, if someone didn't understand what Shinobi said. Uh, by any chance, I don't think there is anyone who didn't understand, but okay. Uh, so, so, so it's basically a coin join where you have to get the public key of, of anyone. And how do you get the public key of anyone who ever done a transaction is like, they either address reused or you do some heuristics uh, based on well this transaction <laughs> this exposed public key has already probably um, owned by the same person at this not exposed UTXO. So that's the that's the way. Once you get the public key, then you can encrypt the message to that guy with the transaction. Um, and that guy can sign the transaction. Now, there is something I don't understand, but Shinobi explained it and I thought I understand, but then I realized I don't, is that how do you choose the output of the other guy at the point where you are proposing the transaction? And there is some magic involved. Uh, and if you can, you can explain it again, I would, I would be happy. You you tweak a key like you would a uh, uh, a key with Schnorr. Well, either way, however, it's uh, gonna be working. It sounds great. Just to like, yeah, keep working the development of added privacy on the network. So and yeah, it's called Snickers, and hell yeah, Snickers are pretty awesome. 
it's it's called Snicker. Don't call well, it Snickers. Snickers. Adam oh, Gibson okay. is going to <laughs> be angry. Shit. Sorry, Adam. Alrighty. Well, I guess next up is uh some pretty good news from Trezor. Uh, something I didn't think I would would say anytime again. But you know. One thing people always think about doing when it comes to backing up their their word seed is splitting things so that you have to have multiple pieces in order to reconstruct something uh, that actually gets your coins. And that's just an absolutely horrible idea with raw seed words because the the like you just need you know a, a large chunk of them and you are exponentially shortening the the work you have to do to brute force what you don't have so trezor has implemented a shamir uh, backup feature using shamir's secret sharding um, where the wallet actually will create a, a backup that splits up your master key the the equivalent of your word seed into like I think three different shares is the the basic one and it encodes the Shamir shares in mnemonic seeds with a, a different word set um, that's actually um, it's going to be a lot longer because of the entropy involved um, I think if for 128 bits it's um, 20 words for each share I think and for 256 bits I think it was um, 20 something or 30 but this this allows you to actually you know break this up in a way where if you have these three shares you need two of them to reconstruct your key and a malicious person getting just a single share does absolutely nothing like there is nothing they can do with that single share in order to reconstruct your keys and they haven't implemented this yet but they've also um, set up a feature so that you can actually take like a, your key, break it into three shares, and you can take one of those shares and break that up into different shares. So you can take, um, say, one of these two of three shares that would give you all of your keys and break one of those, those shares into a three of five share. And you can kind of nest things like this. And like I said, that isn't implemented yet but they are planning on integrating that and there's a command line demo available. And there's also um, plans on the cold card roadmap to integrate this in a future um, version as well. And so, you know, hopefully I think it would be a very good thing for this to catch on because it, it allows you to do that securely, you know, have your your key back up, but break it up in a, in a redundant way. So you need multiple pieces that does not have that big catch all problem where now just one of those pieces makes it a lot easier for somebody to brute force your keys and steal your coins. And so like, you know, Obviously, I've been pretty vocal about my opinion on hardware wallets that don't use secure elements or like actually try to deal with physical security. But this Shamir backup scheme is completely unrelated to the actual hardware you're using to sign with your keys. Like this backup method is a big improvement for actually having that seed back up and being able to take more security measures with it. So regardless of my issues that I have with the actual treasure treasure device and its security, like having this as a backup mechanism is a good thing. And you know, I can't say this is anything but an improvement. But can't you just cut your memonic words into pieces and give it to no, other No. No, no. No, no, Para, because every single word that you have is literally cutting the search space to get the rest of the words in half. No. And if you say that again, I'll slap you.
Thank, thank you for explaining the joke again. I I would try to try to sound funny, but uh, but you explained it and you just make me sound stupid. Like I would really think that's the case. Thank you. That's what I do. I told you that. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> have to like re-explain the difference for a while because a lot of people you know certain wannabe star wars mm. lookalikes uh, <laughs> are very insistent on splitting up mnemonic seeds and having that be a secure thing and no 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 we're doing it in three pieces and some of them overlap and all of this garbage it's like no there is a very big difference between this and just splitting up your bit 39 mnemonic seed like this is a whole this is like a different standard called slip 39 it's like a different thing it's not the same thing as splitting up your mnemonic seed and we'll have to keep repeating that and making sure that people don't think that just because we're now doing this or this is now an option at least for uh users that that means they can start splitting up any seed that they have, no matter the number of words or how the words were generated or any of that. So we'll have to keep repeating. Yeah, this is like splitting up a word seed is like taking a four digit passcode and just writing those four digits down in a different place. Like this would be like creating a huge like 20 digit number for each like number in the pin and having some crazy math formula that you have to put it through to actually get the pin like one is safe one is absolutely under no circumstances safe what if you create 24 words and then you split it into two that seems safe to me no if the 12 words are safe, then 24 divided by 2 is safe. No. It's simple math, you know, it's no. math. <laughs> I, th I, think we should, I think we should create a math bot to solve this problem. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, geez, this thing has been kept coming back up. I swear, it's like, all right, I'm interested to see what Trezor's doing here. And yeah, it's good to see that somebody's actually taking this seriously. Yeah, we can move on. All right, so yeah, that's about the show. Take us on to our final thoughts. Nopar, you got something to share with us about crypto scam? Yes, uh, can can you see the full Twitter name? It's not in front of Yeah, me. it's at Crypto Scam Hub. What? Isn't it Crypto Scam something? Yeah, Crypto Scam Hub, H U B. Crypto Scam Hub, yes. No, so this is a Twitter that I just. I think it's pretty. Pretty well known, but I just I just got got in got to know about it very lately, and this is really fun. I just want to want to say that check out uh, the crypto scam hub and it's like Dan Dark Peel was at the height of the scaling debate. It's 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 full of high quality memes. Yeah, it's it's awesome. What are your? All right, my, my final thought. thought is something from Nick Zabo just tweeted this out, and it's uh, discussing this transaction of ninety four thousand five hundred four Bitcoin. It's over a billion dollars being transferred from one unknown wallet to another. He says such confidence in Bitcoin is splendid, but a ninety four thousand five hundred BTC transaction tempts fate. If, re if recipient can make that much from re reversing the transaction, they can afford to run a 51% attack for more than 40 days. Big if and very vis visible, but security here depends more on trust and less on the protocol itself. And yeah, just like really, I was just like really fascinated by this, uh, this transaction. How much moves in one Bitcoin transaction, you can move that much value, but 
yeah, I think Nick brings up a good point here about the amount of value tied up in that transaction, and that does require a large amount of trust. Yeah, I mean, that's something I don't think people really understand is like there's no such thing, even in Bitcoin, as absolute finality. There's just how expensive is it to undo something? And if the amount of money that you can gain from undoing something is a crazy amount of money, then there's a higher probability that somebody might actually try to undo it. Like it's it's just the raw incentives of the system. It's Craig Wright in Clayman's brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But yeah, that was definitely a transaction worthy of uh, remembering. Janine, you got a final comment or a final uh, thought for us? Yeah, I do. My final thought is that there was a surprise. I mean, it was surprising because this is coming from Judge Anthony Tringa. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, who is a judge who is presiding over you know, Chelsea Manning's refusal to participate in the stupid grand jury against WikiLeaks. Um, this same judge just a few days ago ruled that the terror watch list, which, uh, by the way, includes like more than two dozen, I think around two dozen American citizens um, or more than that. Well, the lawsuit that this was covering was brought by almost two dozen Americans who are on the list. Um, and Trenga basically ruled at the district level that the terror watch list is, un is unconstitutional because uh, he notes that an individual's placement in into that database does not require any evidence that the person engaged in criminal activity committed a crime or will commit a crime in the future, which is like, that's absolutely terrible because if you're put on a list, anyone who sees you on that list will assume that you're a terrorist, obviously. That's the purpose of, or you'd think that was the purpose of the list, but um, basically he ruled that that's unconstitutional. So I guess then this is part of a lawsuit. Um, and I assume that there's this is obviously going to be challenged. And so who knows if it's going to actually have a substantial effect on whether the terror will continue to exist or whether it will be I don't know, moved to maybe you know, have some due process in there somewhere. Uh, but maybe that's too big of an expectation for this government. Yeah, hearing any kind of sitting judge, especially on top of a subject like that, talking about something being unconstitutional seems pretty insane. Yeah, but that's uh, welcome to the world of crazy large government engaging in large overreach of power and bizarro freedom world land mm -hmm. well i don't know uh i guess my final thought is i put out a new shy 256 go watch it or why am i doing this i don't know bye guys later everyone bye bye <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to